Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my channel. My name is Kylie, if you're new, and today, yes indeed, I'm reviewing Wait, what am I reviewing? <laughs> Today I'm reviewing Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare. This came out in 1991, received a 19% on Rotten Tomatoes, and here's what happened. Murderous ghoul Freddy Krueger has slaughtered every last child in his hometown. He ventures onto a new location, scouting fresh young victims to hack up with his finger blades. He arrives in a small town in which his long lost daughter, Maggie, works as a therapist for troubled youths. He attempts to recruit her for his dastardly pursuits, but she has other ideas. Father and daughter meet for a bloody showdown that will determine Freddy's fate once and for all. So I have just a couple fun facts and then I'll get into my review. This movie had the highest grossing opening weekend up until Freddy vs. Jason in 2003. That was a little surprising to me, but then I realized, well, now these movies have had seven years to gain steam, so even if the movie itself wasn't like that great, it makes sense why people would flock to the theaters. It ended up being the fourth highest grossing movie in the entire franchise. Rachel Talalay is the only woman to direct a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. This is the first A Nightmare on Elm Street movie not to have Elm Street in the title. Even though she plays a teenager, Leslie Deanne was 26 at the time of filming this movie. She also starred in 976 Evil, which was the horror movie directed by Robert England. She also plays Sue Collar on the episode Cabin Fever in Freddy's Nightmares, which on that topic I actually have some news. One of my subscribers, Rob Nimmo, actually is sending me an entire collection of the Freddy's Nightmare TV show on DVD. So thank you for that. If you guys are interested in hearing my thoughts on the series like as a whole, I could do, you know, kind of like an umbrella review like how I did for Hannibal with my dad. If you guys are interested in that, then let me know. I will include that as part of this series. Rob, I appreciate it so much. You really like did not have to do that, but that's amazing. They aren't currently producing them on DVD right now, but in a couple of months, they're actually gonna be producing them on Blu-ray and you guys will be able to buy them as well. So once that happens, I'll absolutely have a link to that if you guys are interested and you guys can purchase them as well. Unfortunately though, when I get things sent to me, I have to send them to my P.O. box, but that is all the way back in Northern California. But good news, I am visiting home in just a couple of weeks to get my braces adjusted. So I'll do an unboxing of the other stuff that I've been sent recently. I can't wait. Okay, that was a long tangent, back to my fun facts. Oh, okay, I only had one more, and that is the fact that Johnny Depp has a cameo in this movie. So last week my comments were actually pretty split on whether or not you guys thought that this movie was better or worse than part five. And I think it's honestly really hard to say because this movie made a lot of similar mistakes to part five. Some of them ended up being worse, but some of them ended up being better than part five. So let's just get all into that. I think I am gonna start with the special effects because we made a very clear transition in this movie from the last one. In part five, most if not all of the effects were actually practical. Whereas in this movie, they made a major shift and a lot of the effects are still practical, but a good majority of them are like CGI or computer animated or made with a green screen that you can like obviously tell. For me, one of the things that I really latched onto with this series and why I was really enjoying these movies is the practical effects. Because for me, some of the other sequels might not have been that strong, but they had really good, really cool practical effects. Growing up in an age with hardly any practical effects and a ton of CGI, that's something that I can really appreciate because they just don't really do that that much anymore. So they made that shift, and I don't know if it's because now we're in the 90s or whatnot, you guys can kind of let me know the cultural context of this, but it was a very dramatic shift in the special effects. And I've mentioned in my videos about the Nightmare movies before, it's, it's kind of difficult for me to suspend my disbelief, but I still do so willingly with a lot of these movies. Another thing I've also brought up is there's kind of a lack of continuity and Freddy's powers always kind of seem to grow and change from movie to movie. And they don't do a great deal of explaining exactly why that is. So there's not much to like ground you in your suspension of disbelief. It's, pr it's pretty easy to like get taken out of the movies at times. So that is mainly why I feel like the CGI and stuff did this movie a disservice. Now it's obviously hard for me to look at it a objectively and like pretend that I don't know what good CGI looks like because back then, you know, it, it all kind of looked a little bit goofy like that. So I just can't pretend that I don't know what good CGI looks like. It It's aged really poorly and that's not their fault. I just feel like what they were doing was way too ambitious for the time and they had proven to us already that they used really good practical effects. So it's just kind of surprising to me. It's a little off-putting as well why they would include such god-awful, like obvious computer jazz 
computer-generated animation in this movie. I don't know. It, it didn't work for me. So, you know, that's tough. I, I really try not to judge old movies based on their CGI. It's just like, if something seems too ambitious, j maybe scale it back a little bit, you know? I think the worst instance of this is probably Freddy's death. I think it's Freddy's death. Kids. But sometimes with old movies, that kind of just is what it is. So actually on the topic of the dream demons and the continuity issues and stuff like that. So they finally actually gave us more of an explanation for Freddy's powers. Finally, they gave us an explanation as to why his powers have been evolving and like why all this stuff is going on. Because admittedly in the beginning of the movie, when there was that scene where Freddy like hurled that kid off a bus through this weird veil, like between the two towns, and then it was like Freddy's dream world and then in, like the daytime real world. I was like, okay, like we have taken it too far at this point. Freddy's powers, this is, this is too much. So at least with that in this movie, we do get an explanation. And so I'm able to forgive that. It's not necessarily the type of explanation that I wanted, but it does make sense. I do wish with all my heart that there had just been more continuity from the first one from the get go, but literally right off the bat with the first sequel, they completely kind of changed Freddy's powers. So it's been doomed since then, but I I do think that the explanation from this movie kind of did service the previous sequels pretty well. It was absurd. I, I will say that if this was a standalone movie, I I would not stand for that. I would have thought it was so dumb. But I do think it answers some of our questions from the previous sequels and it, it was fine. On the topic of continuity though, it just seems like at this point they really aren't sure what they're going for and this was definitely proven by part five. I now have nicknames for these first six movies because of how different they are tonally and like what each one was kind of trying to do because they all seem to have very different agendas. So starting with the original, my nicknames are as follows. The classic, the homoerotic one, the superhero one, the karate one, the sad one, and now the cartoon one. These ever shifting tones make it really hard to latch on to anything continuity wise. And a lot of these movies kind of end up just being standalones. The only true constant is Freddy and even his tone changes drastically from one movie to the next. Anyways, back to this one and the tone of this movie. So one reason why I call this one the cartoon one is because it is again, such a tonal shift, but I have reasons for why I call it this one. And all these reasons are also simultaneously why I think this movie seems so much more dated to me. Freddy makes a Wizard of Oz reference. Okay, that felt very random and out of nowhere. Freddy also has some one-liners about the gaming system that he's using, which I'm assuming was popular in 1991. I, I don't really know. I wasn't born for another eight years, so I had no idea what he was talking about. These comedic pop cultural references just date the movie to an extreme that I don't feel is necessary because I believe that gaming system and the catchphrase he used, which I can't remember now, literally came out that year in 1991. And that just puts a literal stamp on the movie like, bam, this is how old I am. I think I also just get a little bit salty about the joke with the gaming system because I wasn't even alive back then so I can't really be in on a little inside joke. Hi, I'm editing and I just realized that I didn't really explain why I called this one the cartoon one. It's mainly because of all the computer generated animation and like the dream demons and all the stuff that's going on like with the graphics. Not to mention when Freddy is playing with that kid and the kid is in the video game. Obviously when he's in the video game world it looks like he's just living in a cartoon. So that is why. Just thought I'd clarify things. Anyways, moving on to the characters in this movie. I didn't like them. I just didn't find any of them to be that likable. I don't really have much to say about them, honestly. We also have the John Doe, who we never learn like who his name is or who he is. I know that there are like fan theories that he is possibly Alice's son. Although in the beginning of the movie, it does say 10 years later, so then her son would only be 10. But it also doesn't say 10 years later from a certain year. Like we don't actually know exactly what year this takes place. That's neither here nor there. You guys feel free to let me know your theories about that down below. Now in terms of the character of Maggie and her ending up being Freddy's daughter, I don't really want to talk about their relationship. I'm just not gonna get into that. It's very dark and I just feel like it didn't, again, the tones were conflicting. I feel like such a broken record at this point, but I guess I'll say it again. So the super dark tones mixed with the over the top absurdity just doesn't work for me. It actually makes me quite annoyed with Freddy, which I absolutely don't want to happen. I feel like when their intention was just to be more comedic and not interject all these super dark tones. Freddy's absurdity and his one-liners were really successful and I love them. These past two movies just 
<laughs> just didn't do it for me. So that kind of brings us to the conclusion of this review. Um, you guys, I didn't like this movie. I also think I agree with the people that said that this one was worse than part five, because at least in part five, I really liked all those characters. In this one, I just didn't really relate to any of them. I wasn't a fan. I found them annoying. But on that note, I am really looking forward to the next one. I'm looking forward to see what Wes Craven does with his new Nightmare movie. I'm assuming it can't be worse than this one because Wes Craven is involved and I do love his work. So that just about does it. But if you're new here, please go ahead and click that subscribe button and the notification bell because then you'll be notified whenever I post. And I do post pretty frequently. I post three days a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. You can also follow me on social media on Letterboxd, Instagram, and Twitter at Kai Johns. On Letterboxd, that's where I talk about movies that I don't intend on reviewing on this channel. And then on Instagram, I always let you guys know what movies I'm watching so you can watch them too, just in case I do a review of them. I also post horror news and pictures of my movie stacks because I love posting movie stacks. And then my Twitter is just mainly for activism, so I don't know if you'll be interested in that. But that just about does it. I hope you tune in on Friday. I'm comparing the original Ring to The Ring 2002. It should be a really interesting video. I hope you tune in for my other nightmare videos and for my Halloween series and all that good stuff. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!